everybody, welcome back to the Inside Nebraska YouTube channel. He's Steve Marek. I'm Zach Carpenter. And uh, Steve, we finally gotten a chance to sit down and do a spring game rewatch, or at least uh, take in most of it, uh, first half, if not um, every part of the game. Uh, wanted to come in here a few days after. Uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. It'll be going up on Wednesday. Um, just to sort of get uh, final thoughts, reactions, and obviously overreactions, because we all know the spring game is the most important thing that is going to tell us everything we need to know about Nebraska in the 2023, uh, 2023 season. Isn't that right? I know you love, I know you love the spring game and uh, that things like Bryce Benhart, if he looked good, then that was going to tell us everything we needed to know about his future. Um, so what's, uh, what was your number one overreaction from uh, the spring game? my number one overreaction would be that Tony White's defense is going to be in the backfield quite often in the fall of 2023. I just, uh, the aggressiveness was really fun to watch. Um, the confusion that the different fronts that the defense had, I think it confused Nebraska's offensive line and, and uh, Tony White's defense kind of won a lot of reps on Saturday um, and, and did so with some TFLs. Some sacks, obviously. Uh, Prince Will Uman Mielen, getting used to saying that last name. He was uh, in the backfield doing a really good job tracking down a really athletic guy like Jeff Sims. We saw Cam Lenhart, another early enrollee true freshman, beat Turner Corcoran at left tackle, flushed Sims out. Um, but then Sims kind of showed you everything that you wanted to know about him on that uh, certain play with uh, Lenhart kind of scrambling out using his athleticism feeling the rush coming to him and then bailing at the exact right time. That was awesome to see. I thought, I mean, you're going to talk about it a little bit more with Jeff, but um, he was really impressive. I really liked what I saw from him, but uh, overreactions, Tony White's defense, uh, the aggressive style, it's going to be in the backfield a lot. I, I think during the season, and that's kind of fun to think about. Very similar to last spring games overreaction, right? When Garrett Nelson yeah. had all the sacks and uh, it was like, okay, this, uh, Garrett Nelson and this Nebraska pass rush is going to be fearsome and lethal in 2022. And um, that didn't play out as quite as anticipated. So yeah, obviously we're being a little facetious that the spring game does not tell us uh, everything that we need to know about, uh, yeah. about this yeah. team. I, yeah. I want to get on record that like, this is just an overreaction and I understand how last year's spring game went. Uh, Garrett Nelson looked like an all American uh, getting back there. And so you know, if the defensive line is getting the backfield a lot, that doesn't really necessarily mean good things about the offensive line. And so I'm well aware that, you know, if two true freshmen are in the backfield a lot, that doesn't uh, speak well in regards to the offensive line. But, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm not letting that take away from the good the good um, performances from Prince Will and Cam. Um, and throw Maverick Noonan in there too. Kai Wallen, two new faces as well. Um, so... It was just, I don't know, it was really fun to watch the defensive front. I I, I think um, that's basically what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, and with all that in mind that the spring game does not tell us everything, um, I, I, th I do think it does tell us a little bit, but uh, my number one overreaction is that Jeff Sims is the no-doubt QB1 going into uh, the fall that they'll have for the fall, which, um, no, he's not the no-doubt quarterback number one. He's not the no-doubt starter, but, I mean – I felt going into the spring game that uh, after 14 spring practices that uh, my inkling was that Sims had become the betting favorite, the front runner. Um, but we're not counting out. We're definitely not counting out uh, Casey Thompson in that race. But uh, what I thought he showed Saturday, our first chance to really see him throw because in the open practice sessions, um, as I 30, uh, 45 minutes, I think the first one, and then uh, three more it totaled about 100 minutes of open practice time throughout the spring. But throughout that entire time, the only time we saw the quarterbacks throwing uh, was on these play action rollout drills. Um, and they're just short lob tosses, uh, mostly of the running backs or to their fellow quarterbacks. So we didn't really get to see him throw until until Saturday. And I mean, without Casey Thompson there, um, it's clear that Sims is obviously far and away above the others on the roster in terms of, uh, um, in terms of the depth chart and he finished nine of 13, 138 yards, 130, 139 yards. Uh, he also had a rushing touchdown and that he had some highlight plays. Um, like the one you talk about spinning out of that sack from, uh, that 
likely sack from Cam Lenhart. Um, had a couple other, uh, a couple other nice runs of touchdown I mentioned. Um, he scrambled for another first down um, or close to the sticks. And I mean, his first throw, that 38 yard strike to Nate Borgature, it wasn't, the throw was not in a tight window, but like you rewatch it as a post route and it hit Borgature literally perfectly. Like, I mean, right here in stride, like right in the numbers. And that allowed him to rumble for another 20 yards down the field. He had that, uh, he had a 15 yard pass to Kemp, um, to Billy Kemp and on that was on successive plays that was the second play the first one um was sort of uh so, something we saw in during those spring practices where we sort of observed like oh the play action play action on stretch plays is going to be uh something that that was something they were working on a lot and we saw that on a 24 yard throw to to kemp um or some stretch play play action uh long developing downfield passing play and um he threw it to what was who was a wide open Billy Kemp for uh, for 24 yards downfield, uh, and even I mean the accuracy is what I was looking for with Sims. Like the number one thing I was looking for out of him, along with his just sort of processing and uh, progressing throughout a throughout his reads and his and the plays. And I mean on that first drive after the throw to Borkature, they they took a first and ten shot play um, on a go route down the down the right sideline to Sean Hardy and uh, throws a little bit off. But um, mm -hmm. it was still it was it was right there, and I mean I'm not trying to sugarcoat it or spin zone it, but I mean Sims did put it in a place where it's either going to be a touchdown or an incompletion, and the coverage is one on one coverage is pretty tight, and uh, I mean Sims put it in the place where his guys either going to make the play or they're going to get uh, another um, another shot on second and ten, like I said on one of those shot plays, but. Overall, yeah, I thought Sims looked, uh, I thought he looked pretty good. Um, and Matt Rules said that exact same thing. He looked pretty good and he was pretty impressed with him. Um, but Sims, I don't know if you have any final thoughts on him. I know, yeah. I, I know you're going to be, I know you were impressed with him too, but probably um, a little more balanced or not balanced, but a little more take a step back, I guess. I don't know than I am. Yeah. I, uh, wanted to see the accuracy, like you said, and you mentioned the, the, um, completion to Nate Borgature up the seam. I really loved that. Like, that's not an easy throw because you have to get it over the second level linebacker and you have to get it in front of the safety. And Jeff did that on that, on that play. He, the pass was right over the top of whichever linebacker, it might've been John Bullock's outstretched hands. And he just dropped it right in that bucket. And that was a really, really good play. And after the game, I asked him about it, and he said that he that's one of his throws that gets him comfortable and in the zone and in a rhythm. And so maybe that's something that we can look forward to in the fall if he is the starting quarterback. My, uh, Marcus Satterfield dials dials something up like that to get a get, to get Jeff a big target like uh, Nate Borkatcher, the six five tight end, run him down the seam, and boom, he's right there. He could throw Thomas Fedotti in there as well, maybe a Rick Gilbert. I don't know. But the two other completions I want to talk about was his 19 yard. It was so it was in the second quarter and Nebraska was in 12 personnel. They had two tight ends out there and up front on the offensive line, there was like a counter run action. So they pulled the right guard and they pulled Janarin Bonner, who was the tight end, the number two tight end on that side. They pulled them around and that sucked in the defense. And so uh, Ramir Johnson was in the backfield with Jeff Sims. So he'd stuck the ball in his uh, stomach. He saw that Malcolm Hartzog was biting on the run fake. He yanked the ball and he threw the gl glance route, which is basically a, a long slant right in the middle of the field to Marcus Washington for a 19 yard gain. That got me excited because, you know, when you start moving up front, getting the offensive line and tight ends moving, it just catches the eyes of the defense so much. And they one one false step forward, you know, it's going to create more room behind them. And Jeff Sims put it on the money. That was really awesome to see another one. Um, I think it was in the third quarter after, I think it was after at halftime, a 14 yard completion to Marcus Washington again, which is, you know, it was good to see Marcus Washington kind of be Jeff Sims guy. Um, yeah. It Billy seems Kemp like chemistry sort of a connection between those two on the field, uh, yeah. building up after we talked with rule after the second Saturday scrimmage on April yeah. 15. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not worried about Billy Kemp. I think Billy Kemp is going to lead the team in receptions. He is solid. He is a veteran. We don't need to worry about Billy Kemp. He's going to be there 
Um, every game he's going to be that safety blanket, I think, for whoever starts at quarterback. But to see Marcus Washington create that connection with Jeff Sims, kind of a downfield threat. There weren't there, there weren't a lot of downfield shots, and that's one thing that I'm sure Satterfield and Rule will want to implement and want to show, obviously, during the season to try to stretch out that defense. But um, it was good to see Marcus Washington be that number one receiver. Um, you know, and that the play that I'm talking about, a 14 yard completion. It was when I guess Jeff Sims was kind of flushed out of the pocket and he was rolling to his right and it just looked very, very smooth. It looked comfortable. He was throwing on the run and he led uh, Marcus Washington. It could have been a little bit better, but we're nitpicking. It was still completion. It, was, it still would have been a first down in a game. So um, it was a great catch, great sliding catch. Almost uh, Marcus Washington kind of looked like a, a shortstop, almost gobbling up a ground ball. But um, that was another really good play that stood out to me. So. Overall, Jeff Sims, I mean, obviously the touchdown run too, where he runs through uh, Ruquan Buckley and Kane Williams, who I think was playing with a broken hand or something. He had a a, a, a wrap on his right hand, but whatever. I mean, you're on defense. You need to make that tackle. Um, but yeah, good stuff from Jeff Sims. I, I really, you know, I was kind of joking with a friend who I was uh, texting with um, after the game and we were talking about that play. And, you know, if you see Jeff Sims completing those passes and you see him running over two guys on defense on his way to a touchdown on a QB draw. If you're Casey Thompson, you're kind of like gulping. It's like gulp. Uh, you know, he, he's uh, he, he definitely put himself in front right now and he looked good in my opinion. Um, but you know, I wouldn't count out Casey Thompson, but as of right now, it, it looks, it looks like it's going to be tough because Jeff Sims, you know, his accuracy looked good. His arm strength looked good. We know the athleticism is there. He looks like a Greek God, six foot four, 220 pounds, just looks perfect. So um, I don't know. It's going to be really interesting come fall to see what uh, Casey, Casey Thompson can do with this race. Yeah. I think Sims, um, one of the things early on in practice uh, heard rumblings out of uh, out of practice that he looked maybe a little erratic. Maybe it was a little um, uh, processing things a little too. Uh, I don't know about too quickly is the right word, but I know they're just uh, throwing a lot at him. Um, I think they're doing that maybe on both sides of the ball. I mean, just Tony white talked just a couple of weeks ago about how, about, about how they were scaling things back because it was, yep. um, they were throwing a little too much at him. Um, I think Sims maybe was, uh, um, uh, trying to adjust and some growing pains as you at, throughout the first couple of weeks of spring ball. And then think the accuracy wasn't as accurate as you would like, maybe a little too much velocity on his throws. Um, looking like, uh, looking like a, uh, MLB a pitch, uh, reliever is throwing a little too fast and uh, not hitting the hitting the targets as as consistent as you want. But I thought we saw that out of him. Um, I thought we saw a uh, pretty accurate thrower on uh, or uh, accurate passer on on Saturday. And what I noticed, I mean, he flashed the arm strength and then that sort of that quick release motion where it just looks effortless sometimes and uh, really fluid. So, I mean, we're not trying to build up. Sims into an all Big Ten quarterback right now. I'm just kind of underlining that he uh, he looked pretty impressive. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to to mention was like in in terms of Jeff Sims, he's missed he's missed a lot of games in his career because of injuries. Um, and you know I want to give him the benefit of the doubt because Saturday was like his first real like I guess you can count the scrimmages from this from this spring in the same category, but like with the spring game with people in the stands and referees and live hitting and everything it was his first real football game experience basically since like i think he i think uh he he uh stopped playing for georgia tech last season with about five games left and he uh didn't play around the, the final five or four games you're gonna have to check me on that but to nurse his injury and, and then he just kind of called it a career there and entered the portal because he knew he was leaving but so it's been a long time since jeff sims have stepped on a field as the guy leading an offense. So it's like, I want to give him some grace. That was his first time being out there in a long, long time and coming, coming off a, a, a foot injury. I think it was at jaw tech. So, you know, Jeff Sims is stepping into a new environment, a new program, a new offense, new coaches, everything is new for this cat right now. And I think that once he just gets more reps, um, you know, he's going to just get more comfortable and more comfortable. And Saturday was an excellent first step. Yep. And in reviewing the spring game, wanted to touch on um, one thought on the offense, one thought on the defense, but sticking with the offensive theme here, um, after talking about Sims, he 
he's throwing to a, a group of receivers. You talked about Marcus Washington and uh, Billy Kemp. Um, and I'm, a, I'm in agreement with you that Kemp, I mean, I've written that a couple times um, that he, uh, he, I just think he's, he, whoever wins the starting job, uh, I have been saying this throughout the spring that he is probably going to be the, the starting quarterback or the court, just the quarterback on the field's favorite target. Cause uh, yep. for reliability and the safety valve um, that you mentioned, uh, Washington could be that big play threat. He's done that throughout spring ball. Um, but I don't know what you, what, what'd you see out of the receivers on, uh, on Saturday? Well, I like, I like what uh, Marcus Washington, I would have wished he would have got a little, little more, more targets, I guess, but um, he was good, but outside of him, you know, I, I don't know if there was a whole lot there. And that leads me to think that, you know, come fall camp, come the summer when the entire roster gets here as like the 2023 guys, you know, there's going to be every opportunity in the world for those guys. Like, you know, Malachi Coleman, my favorite guy, Jaden Doss, who I think is, is gonna, is capable of, I don't want to say Malachi is not capable, but I think Jaden Doss, you know, just from watching his film, how he runs, how his body is built already. It looks like, you know, he's, he's almost 200 pounds, I think at six foot when he gets the ball on space, he runs like a running back. Cause he is a former running back. He did a lot of different things at his um, high school offense, lining up in the out wide in the slot at tailback. So he has a lot of experience handling the ball in different situations. And I think that, you know, with an uh, offensive coordinator like Marcus Satterfield and how he likes to use different guys, case in point, Janarin Bonner, um, you know, I think, Jaden Doss can can kind of be a, a toy for Satterfield to plug in once in a while and and see what he can do. Yeah, and then my uh, my take on the offense or what I kind of, the point I wanted to uh, to talk about is is that running back room. I know we talk about it all the time and don't have a ton of new information for you. I think uh, it's been the same way throughout uh, throughout uh, pre spring and throughout spring ball and Saturday's game. Um, I think EJ Barthel has uh, has a lot of really good options in there. I know the staff loves their loves their room and what they have. And I mean, at the top of that depth chart, you have three guys: in Gabe Irvin Jr., Anthony Grant, and AJ Allen. Um, in addition to Ramir Johnson, uh, and all of the all all three of those guys, really all four of them, they bring something different to the table. And just something that crossed my mind is is when it comes uh, time for the fall and that the depth chart releases. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we're that there's a chance that we could see that that all caps or next to all three of those guys to designate the starter, Gabe Irvin or Anthony Grant or AJ Allen. And I mean, does it technically matter who's listed as a starter? Probably not, maybe not. Um, but I, I just to, it's sort of just underlying the point of I'm not sure maybe Anthony Grant is does wind up being the bell cow, but I don't I kind of don't see this offense having necessarily a, a, a bell cow back in it. I think um, I think we could see a healthy rotation among them. And that, that was sort of, I, I thought we saw some of that on, on Saturday when, I mean, you have Gabe Irvin, um, that stiff arm run. He has, he has, he has the physicality. He was the first back out there um, on the, on the first series, but him and Anthony Grant were rotating in pretty uh, frequently from what I, from what I saw. And um, I mean, Irvin, like I said, he has that physicality and he's fast. Anthony Grant, I just, uh, I think if he continues to improve, I think he did a little better job. If he continues to improve of not doing the dancing and juking around and just powering through and getting that four or five yard run instead of just, instead of it winding up being a two yard run and then you have the home runs mixed in with it. Um, I just, I don't know. I think they have a pretty well-rounded group. I don't know your thoughts on the running backs. Yeah, first thing first thing I want to go back to what I said about the injury situation with uh, Jeff Sims. So I did find it. He started all 10 games in 2020, which is his freshman year. Then he played in 7 in 2021, and then I was right, he missed the final 5 games of the 2022 season. Okay, running backs, Husker running backs. Um yeah, I just wanted to <laughs> He wanted to be buttoned up. He never missed the Well, yeah, I didn't want somebody to be like, "Oh, well, I heard Steve Marks like blah blah blah," and then he uh, ended up missing only two games, but yeah, it was five. You anyway, know our uh, commenters, you know our subscribers. Yeah. Absolutely. They'll okay. Check so, you. um, Gabe Irvin, there's no doubt in my mind that if given a real opportunity and consistent carries that Gabe Irvin will be successful as a starting running back. Now I'm with you. I don't I think thought you were going to go out that he's no doubt the starting running back. I was going to say, Whoa, oh, no, 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 no
I'm with you. There's going to be some ores on that depth chart for sure. Basically all season. I bet, I bet, I bet, you know, they're going to, they're going to look at the running back room. They're going to see all the talented guys in there and they're going to want to use them, use them in some ways and, and rotate those guys and keep them fresh. But you know, some, some people around here are not very high on Gabe Irvin. I don't understand why he's had a tough career so far. You, you can't not mention his injury situation. You know, the, 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 you know, his true freshman year, he was the very first uh, true freshman to start at uh, running back at Nebraska in the modern era. You know, you don't just walk into a program as an 18 year old and do that. You have to have something to you. And I think he has that inside of him and just listen to the guy talk. He's like a freaky level of like, um, just, honed in and his mindset is almost like scary that like, I don't want to like run into you in a dark alley or else you're going to like beat me up. Um, he was like, that's, uh, that's so what... in the post game press conference rule was talking and Irvin was yeah, over there. He was, was sitting funny. down waiting over on the side. And I, I had the angle from uh, uh, looking at the front of Irvin. He just, he was just sitting there. He looked like he was like, like just he staring was on down his phone. Rule, like he was just yeah rule was talking and uh Rowling. gabe Irvin was just sitting sitting over there waiting for his turn on on his phone looking at his phone and he just like looked pissed off and it was like not smiling or anything and rule looked at him and he's like are you all right and gabe <laughs> yeah, he's like, like are yeah. you happy i think he's happy <laughs> he's are like, you happy are you all right, are you all right? <laughs> like yeah it's like let's give that guy the ball on like third and two um <laughs> but yeah, he's look at his look at his physique, how big and strong he is, how much he's developed since his first year here, and he just hasn't had an opportunity to be a consistent part of the running back room because of the injuries. Last year he had a turf toe that knocked him that sidelined him for a little bit. Um he just hasn't had a smooth a smooth run right one runway to get going and I just think when he is out there, just go back and watch watch his games when he is out there. Like last year at Oklahoma, he ran so pissed off, and it was really fun to watch. He was like, and I know they came in, in garbage time after the game was decided, but he was still wanting to show the coaches that, like, hey, I am here. I am ready. Give me the ball, and we can, like, do stuff. So I don't know. I just think if 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 Gabe Irvin can finally get a real opportunity – get some carries, not always be looking, looking over his shoulder. I think he'll impress. Now, again, I go back to the or situation. There's a lot of talented guys. Um, AJ Allen, Anthony Grant, um, Ramir Johnson might, might find his way in there. Um, you know, there's going to be some ors, and there's the, the carries are going to be uh, delegated out. So, but I, I don't know, man, I'm really high on Gabe Irvin. I hope he does well. Yeah. And then shifting to the defense, um, just, uh, to sort of, focus on uh, spotlight one thing um, from each of us about the defense uh, from what you saw. I mean, um, I don't know. I thought they were physical. I thought they got in the backfield, like you said, and uh, we'll see if that translates to the fall, but uh, number one takeaway or number one thought, whatever uh, you want to talk about on, on the defense. I thought it was notable that the, the first two corners on that first team defense was Quentin Newsom, no shock, but then it was good to see Malcolm Hartzog there because I know that Tony white gave him a shout out and he said, we've been trying him at safety and we've been trying him at uh, slot nickel and everything. Come on guys. Like as soon as, as soon corner. as he, as soon as he tried out there at corner, like it hit me. Cause I wrote about the, when I previewed each position group, I said, who the hell is going to be the number one, number two corner. If they're trying Hartzog out at, safety in all these positions he trots them out there i just roll my eyes i'm like why the hell did i fall for that like uh, okay like yeah like tony it, makes, more, it being... makes a lot more sense for hart to be the yeah. number two corner absolutely like he like the guy i know what tony white was doing tony white was just like being an, a good coach and be like oh no everybody is oh everybody can you know we're gonna give everybody a chance and who knows he might play over here no he's gonna be a starting corner along with quentin you Newsom you won this Nash round tony <laughs> yes tony won that round um but anyway nash hutmacher um, at, at nose defensive tackle, whatever you want to call him. He was moving around on the interior, giving Ben Scott a lot of problems. Uh, that's a handful. Uh, Nash Hutmacher looks like a handful on the interior of the, the defensive line at Nebraska. He, I think he had a really good spring game. He was moving Ben Scott back multiple yards during some run plays, just taking him, getting his hands on him, extending his arms and just pushing back. That's where you see the real power with Nash. So, you know, it, he's, he's going to be one to, to keep an eye on, especially at Minnesota. Um, you're going to really want him out there to be that roadblock. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I I'd say it was good to see Hartzog at, um, corner opposite Quentin Newsom. It was, it was interesting to see 
Um, are you going to talk about Corey Collier? We can bring him up. Yeah. I mean, th- that was my number one. Um, yep. uh, maybe not, not necessarily my number one takeaway, but just what the main thing I want to talk about uh, defense wise is um, like the three starting safeties were, um, or at least for that first, that first series for Corey Collier, uh, boundary safety, Isaac Gifford, the mill safety, um, and the field safety, the free safety was, uh, was Omar Brown and Omar Brown's less surprising, but, um, Mm -hmm. Corey Collier didn't hear much until I think the last, uh, media availability or uh, second to last of spring ball. Um, and so out of everything on Saturday, out of everything on Saturday, Corey Collier was shocking to me. Okay. Yeah. That uh, like he popped up and like, I don't know. No one mentioned Corey Collier, like hardly his name was hardly brought up. And I don't know if that means if the, I mean, Miles Farmer at the Rover at middle safety, I think, I don't know, you know, more than I do about the middle safety Rover. I don't know if it's the same or similar role um, or middle safety is a nickel. Um, but cause Gifford was at the middle safety. Uh, and so I think it's the guy that, you know, when they, when they rotate the, when, however they want to configure the linebackers, if they like move one of them up to the line of scrimmage, you kind of want to replace and put another body in the tackle box. And I think the Rover is going to be that guy. So that's, that would make a lot of sense with Isaac Gifford because he's a solid tackler. He's got some good size on him. So that's why we saw um, Isaac Gifford there. Yeah. So I think, I mean, miles farmer, I mean, I thought I expected him to be out there with the, the one, the number one defense. So maybe it means that um, he's playing behind Gifford a little bit. If, if it, it is true, what we think would be the best uh, uh, role for, for farmer is more of an um, uh, closer to the in, box in box safety mm-hmm. and uh, sort of Rover. Like, I mean, he's just, he can hold up, he, he can hold his own in pass coverage, but it's, it's obviously not his number one strength. Um, despite Tony white, again, trying to, trying to um, pull an over on us and say uh, farmer's been working at, uh, with the corners because of that length. But um yeah, pass coverage is not his his number one strength. His number one strength is in the is I think being closer to the line of scrimmage or being in that box and being more of a physical run stopper. So maybe that's what that means. Um but uh yeah, Corey Collier out there was uh was pretty surprising to see, but um who knows? Who knows going down the line if uh if it means something, nothing, or everything, uh as we go into summer workouts and we go into fall camp. So uh, speaking of that, just to sort of wrap up here, the last thing I wanted to talk about, um, just uh, just a spring game wrap up, like one final thing that uh, that caught your eye, caught your ear. Um, I wanted to just mention a couple things real quick. Just mention the the MJ Sherman press conference. Like, um, I mean, once he when he originally announced uh, that he was transferring to, from Georgia, that he was picking Nebraska, I went back and rewatched uh, September press conference from his time at Georgia and. Um, and it was like, oh, man, like he, like just, well, I, don't, I can't remember what words you used. Um, thought insightful and thoughtful. I think, uh, I think there were a couple of words you used to describe it. It's just like, okay, like you got to focus on it when anytime he takes the podium. Um, yeah. And then he did, he had one interview, one uh, press conference during spring ball. And then um, he spoke after Saturday spring game. And every, every time you see him talk, he's just very intense and serious. And then on Saturday, like he was to see that emotion from just like raw ecstatic emotion, like cheesing, smiling, everything. Like, I don't even have much of a larger point to it. I just thought it was, I just thought it was interesting to see. It was like startling in a good way that like, Oh, like guy that intense is um, feeling this good about uh, coming out of spring ball. And he's just, I don't know. He, he has a bot, he has a body type that is just very, um, I don't know if Nebraska is used to that or has had a, a, a player of his uh, athletic profile's physical build on the defense. I'm, I'm sure they have, but that just stood out to me. SEC guy playing playing for the Huskers. But um, what, one last – my other last thing was that uh, something that when I was re-watching the press conferences on Saturday night and hadn't even noticed this until uh, till listening back to Rules Presser, is um, he sort of snuck in there at the end, uh, something about the offensive line. Um, I mean, I think we've been saying, and I think a lot of people think that they could, they might be going after a offensive lineman in the portal, maybe defensive lineman probably could use, uh, O lineman or D lineman in the portal, but, 
Um, when he's asked about the offensive line depth, I want to read the quote. He said, I don't think there's getting any more depth, right? I mean, we have the players we have, and we have some guys coming in. We're going to coach them up, so we're not thinking about anybody other than the guys on our team, which maybe it could mean that they're not going to go, be going portaling. Maybe I don't believe in that rule. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, uh, um, maybe we shouldn't be reading too much into it, but um, he was very I think upfront it was, about never turning away an offensive lineman and in in, if they think that it would be a good fit. I mean, there's going to be some guys that they're going to kick the tires on in, in the transfer portal, portal right now. An offensive line, they need depth. They ha- They are so young behind the starting five right now. They need more depth. They need more experienced guys. Now, I know the guys in the transfer portal have, on the offensive and defensive lines, they aren't gold. They aren't going to be all conference caliber, but you can find a, a quality backup that that can give you a few reps if one of them happens to go down during a game. I, I truly believe that. So if there's a if there's a name, Matt Rule is going to go after him for sure. So when I hear that in the post-game press conference, I'm just going to say it right now. I don't believe you, Matt Rule. I don't believe you one bit. He's going to clip that. <laughs> He's going to be pissed at you. We no, he's not. He's, he's not going to listen to this. I really hope he doesn't listen to this. Yeah, maybe he could get some ideas, <laughs> and then he could say, "All right, well, we're at least we could hear that. We're going to do the exact opposite of what these two yeah. are saying." Yeah. Um, but any in, in case Matt Rule is uh, listening, uh, watching, listening on the Inside Nebraska YouTube channel, Steve, what what would you have to uh, to tell him or or the rest of the audience about uh, um, about the Huskers coming out of the spring game? What's the one last thought? Yeah, if Matt's listening, hey, Matt, um, I would tell him that I'm not worried about the the fumbles at all. I know you had four each uh, for each side, and I think you lost six of them total. Um, but I'm not worried about it because you're going to have more fall camp practices, and those are the things that you clean up in fall camp. I'm not worried about the fumbles at all. I know a lot of people made a big deal about ball security, and the coaches r- really hone on ball security. That's all they really talked about. Marcus Satterfield talked about Mark. Matt Rule talked about, he said he, I mean, you could tell that Matt Rule has a deep disdain for fumbles. And I respect that um, because Matt Rule is an old school football guy and he just can't stand fumbles, but I don't think they're going to be that bad during the season. I just think it's, that's something that's going to get cleaned up in fall camp. Once they get more practices, more reps, they, they understand who the starting quarterback's going to be, who the running backs are going to be, um, you know, rotating in, that's going to help with like the mesh points of the handoffs and stuff like that. They know Ben Scott's going to know who he's snapping the ball to. Um, the O-line is going to be understanding who they're going to be blocking for better. So there's just a long way to go right now. And I'm not worried about the fumbles at all. Um, I'm wondering no kicker. To, to that real quick. I am wondering if uh, in a weird, in a weird way, like the, the, Team was feeling like, I mean, there's so much positivity and stuff coming from spring ball, but throughout the entire spring, um, rule talked, rule and Sirefield, like you mentioned, mentioned ball security and fumbles, that second scrimmage on uh, on April 15th. That was uh, one of the main issues that rule talked about was he was disappointed to see the team fumble as much as it did. And for it to happen that many times, for it to be that glaring of a spotlight issue, <laughs> six fumbles lost, eight fumbles total in front of, yeah. All the fans in front of, like, I mean, in front of every Nebraska fan who was watching. I wonder if in in one in a weird way he like he's kind of semi like five percent happy that happened so that he can use it as another motivational tool. Like, oh yeah, you showed it our entire fan base like that you cannot uh, secure the ball. So like just allows for even more extra emphasis and need to uh, to keep that thing high and tight. I mean, you've seen the program, Darnell Jefferson. Omar Epps is a running back. Like James Conn made him he's fumbling in practice all the time. So James Conn made him take football everywhere he went on campus, even in class. So maybe, maybe we got some of that coming down. So if you're, if you're a Nebraska student watching, listening to this, you got a football player in one of your classes, maybe uh, be on the lookout for, for him uh, holding the ball in there. But anyway, to digress. Yeah. One, one last thing before I get out of here. Remember when I said that uh, Casey Thompson might have that gulp feeling on the sideline watching Jeff Sims do well. Um, I, I think Timmy bleak road is gulping right now at the thought of Tristan Albano coming in uh, this summer and taking his job because it was not, it was not good. I mean, kickers have a tough life, man. You're, you're either making the field goal or you're, or you're not, it's a win lose game over there. And Timmy bleak road missed two made one. So, um, Hey, Tristan Alvano, Omaha West Side. You you did well last time you were kicking in Memorial Stadium against Gretna, uh, kicking that walk-off field goal, um, one of five field goals on the night. 
the door is open for you, my friend, um, to come in and, and be this team's uh, field goal kicker as a true freshman. And Timmy Bleak wrote after a year that he was pretty solid. I mean, what? Yeah, he was like right, 75%. Like nine for 12. Yeah, nine, like yeah. limited opportunities. And one of those misses was the 50 some yarder and a Georgia Southern. Yeah, with he so did have pressure. it. I don't, yeah. and still, like, it wasn't he, even that bad of a kick. No, no. I mean, he just, he's not a long field goal kicker. And, you know, it was a, I don't blame him for missing that Georgia Southern one. I mean, that was, that was, a long yeah, if you miss this so. kick, your head coach is getting fired. So <laughs> and it's from 53 yards like <laughs> to win the game. So, um, or to tie the game at that point. Um, yeah. So a lot of pressure on that kick. I kind of used to see it as a wash. But uh, yeah, I mean, special teams, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, they want to be a big uh, blocked kicks block kicks unit um as just like one of those one of those details in the game that could take you from a six win team to a seven win team if you can make some game breaking plays momentous plays i mean ask malcolm hartzog and chris kalarvik if uh, yeah. block kick ma- blocked kicks matter um mm-hmm. so yeah that's uh i think that's our final wrap up i don't think you have anything more to say i know uh we're gonna have a busy day might rewatch the spring game a second time see if uh see how much stuff i got wrong on the first first watch and first rewatch but uh we'll have more um a uh, recap of uh of spring ball different written stories on nebraska.rivals.com we'll have more stuff coming um on their inside nebraska youtube channel i know steve and uh jay foreman are F- our former husker and nfl uh nfl veteran um you guys did some film breakdowns um they'll be they'll be going live here over the next uh week or so um so stay tuned for that encourage you to like and subscribe uh, to get these videos dropped directly into your feed. And we'll be back here again uh, very shortly, very shortly. We can't stay away from you guys too long. So for Steve Marek, I'm Zach Carpenter, and we'll catch you guys soon.